Uh, hello everyone, welcome along to Live On Air this evening. Uh, it's with a lot of pleasure that I've got Dr. Greg Morgan uh, with us over in Auckland. And uh, Greg is a very well-known figure in Methodism in Auckland, uh, a, a lay preacher of considerable repute, I might say. But before we get into that and talking about preaching, I wonder whether you'd like to just share a little bit about yourself and your background, Greg. Yeah, tanakwe, David. So I'm a mid-50s Methodist, but in fact I wasn't brought up in the church. I uh, joined the church as an adult and was baptised as an adult uh, as recently as 2002. And um, uh, I went to university for what seems to, <laughs> seems to some people to have been a very long time. I completed a PhD in English Language and Literature at Auckland University and then began working in libraries. And I qualified as a librarian by distance once I started working uh, in the library field. So I now work in local government and I'm a librarian, um, I'm a librarian still, uh, a manager in a public library network. And I'm married to Paul. Paul has to uh, endure many of my sermons and uh, is a popular <laughs> figure at the churches I go to. In many of the places I go, Paul is more popular than I am, I think. he. Um, is uh, an interesting presence and a really supportive one. Um, oh, that's, so that's me in a nutshell. Yep. Um, and I've known Greg, uh, well, I think probably since at least 2002, uh, because you were, you were into the preaching scene pretty, pretty quickly as I recall. Yes, yes. So I've been an active lay preacher for a number of years. Oh, I suppose probably 2002, 2003, something like that. I completed the qualification in 2008, but had been, um, I had I'd taken a number of services by that time. In fact, at its peak, I used to do about 25 or 26 services a year around full-time work. And I don't do anything like that anymore. Uh, I grew tired of my own voice. And an interesting lesson about the church is that the church talks about balance in life, but it won't say no. And uh, <laughs> so I had to learn to say no. And there were some really supportive people around me who uh, advised me to learn to say no sometimes. And so I do. But I'm still uh, quite active as a, as a preacher and, um, you know, would, um, I suppose, preach at least once a month on average. Mm. One, one of the really interesting things about uh, your life as a a preacher has been that every congregation that I've been to that's had uh, you doing a service uh, a week or a month or something beforehand, those are services that really stand out in people's minds. And I've got to say, uh, most publicly, that the last one that I saw you take at Trinity at Waiaki, I thought was simply outstandingly brilliant. It was a uh, uh, really revolving around the idea of telling a poem, uh, yes. re reciting a poem. And it was such a simple thing in one way to do, but so deep and profound in another, that people could have sat and listened to another hour, if you like, of what you were doing. It was simply fantastic. Now, I suspect that you've been studying preaching from uh, an academic perspective as well as this practical thing. So how, how did you become interested in 14th century studies? And what's that got to do with preaching? <laughs> well, I uh, studied Old English and Middle English, Old Norse uh, philology at the university and so came across this text of sermons from the 14th century, in fact translated from an Anglo-Norman work from the early 13th century, so from around about the time of the Fourth Lateran Council. And the sermons were written in Anglo-Norman so that they will be accessible to lay people. Really interesting to think of that. And of course, Anglo-Norman uh, rapidly became the way not to be accessible to the ordinary person. So they were translated into uh, 14th century English, uh, an early London dialect probably. So kind of roughly the language of Chaucer. And um, hmm. so I've got interest in those sermons, uh, sermons from a, a language point of view. And as always happens in a PhD, you know, you reach that point when you realize that the PhD is about to become something else. And you have to stop yourself making it for something else because you will never come out of it. And what it started to become for me was a study of the analogues, the 
sources, the Latin sources, uh, other works that were related. So I became interested in um, the, the context, really, out of which, you know, these uh, linguistic artifacts arose. And when I did do some theology papers subsequently, I thought, golly, if I had my time over, oh, well, maybe I'd do some English, and yes, I'd do some history, as I did at university, but I perhaps had really found my subject in theology. And I seriously thought about completing a theology degree. Uh, but nowadays, I read theologically, uh, I read in theological works, um, and I critique them a little in an amateurish kind of way. But I also feel that everyday experiences should inform preaching. And that's what the poetry is about. I quite often use biography in sermons as well, and in services generally I will shape a service around a biography sometimes because I find that biographies really connect with congregations. A life story... Sort of like a, a life, life story of saints. Breaks through. No, no, not at all. Uh, people like Sheila Thorne, the actress who was married to John Thor, who played Morse, for instance. She's written a couple of great autobiographies, and one of them in which she counters her own prejudice against the, the Germans. Uh, she was evacuated as a child through the Second World War and realized that she was harboring this big grudge against the German people. So she not only encounters it, but then she counters it by going to Germany. And there's a great story there to share with congregations, which, you know, just sheds a very personal light on how we think more inclusively. Um, I think that's a, a really great example. Um, I was thinking when I said Lives of Saints mm. uh, about your 14th century mm. <laughs> preachers. Um, but of course, what you do is, uh, every service that I've heard you take is actually about what people are thinking and doing and saying and writing and creating today. When I uh, was doing my edition of those 14th century sermons, it was really interesting that some of the saint stories were retold, some quite old stories. So the story of St. Fursy, which is kind of a 6th century uh, saint story uh, was retold many centuries later and was kind of the basis of the, some of the thinking around purgatory and, and that rather repellent theology as it was developing. Well, in the same way, you know, any, any story can be kind of picked up from its social context and with a bit of respect for that social context can be used in another way to illumine experience and to look for for connections. I quite often think about saint stories and the great stories of the past, um, classics sometimes. I tend not to use them when I'm actually preaching because they can be quite alienating. Um, not always. Um, I use snippets sometimes. You know, I'm a great, uh, one of my favorite quotations is from Aristotle that, I'll oh, get this, Susan, uh, that um, poetry is truer than history. And by poetry, Aristotle would have meant uh, drama, the drama on stage, tragedy. And I use that a lot because uh, literature will tell us under certain sets of circumstances how people of particular types behave. And literature is freer than history in that it's not wedded to particular facts. Um, so, so in that sense... Uh... Uh, uh, the life of saints, whether in our own era or in previous eras, and by saints here I mean Christian yes, people, uh, that kind of telling of their story in some ways helps to build up a hagiography, uh, but more than a hagiography, it's participating in making the story our own, through incorporating the stories of others. Yes, uh, and, and remembering that among the saints, we could all be counted. So it's quite fun sometimes, you know, to have a, a list of some notable people and then just gradually to bring in some uh, characters, individuals, people could identify with. And then if you know the congregation quite well, you can quite easily get the congregation chipping in uh, other names, people they know, 
Uh, hardly anybody would put their hand up and say, please enroll me on the list of the saints. I don't think they would do that. But <laughs> <laughs> I might try it sometime. But they will certainly give you the names of other people or of things going on in the life of that congregation. And I think that kind of involvement is really powerful and should be what church is for. I came away from uh, that service that I referred to earlier thinking that is exactly what church is for, uh, because it involved us in so many different levels of participation. And I wondered, um, in terms of all the background with philology and ac other academic studies, whether you think that they, those studies have helped you to broaden the base towards inclusivity. Uh, yes, I think they have. Uh, you asked one uh, question of me about whether I use my PhD study in my work, and my immediate response was to say, well, no. And then, <laughs> that was just in my head, I said no. And then over about a week, I thought about that, and I remembered the book, I haven't looked at it for years, but C.S. Lewis's The Discarded Image, where he trawls through the great literature of the Middle Ages and the English Renaissance and tries to build a model of how the world was in that literature. And he um, uh, looks at the kind of uh, story that was built alongside familiar society and the bookishness of it. And also, you remember all that stuff about kindly inclinings and the natural order of the world and the connectedness of things. And it struck me that, in fact, I have something of that medieval mindset, I think, about landscapes and connectedness. You know, I, when I read um, uh, a biography of Tolkien or Lewis, not that I have ever in any way uh, operated at the level of those, of those scholars, and I wouldn't pretend to, of course, uh, but I can remember the same kind of passion with which I first encountered a book and seen the landscape. And um, so I think I do use my study all the time in how I think about things. And the poem that you are talking about, the Glenn Cahoon poem, what I really wanted people to do in that service was to think about a slightly challenging biblical text, but to go away with something that was indigenous that they could use in the same way that we might use a biblical text and have one as a bridge to the other, which is why I use Joy Cowley a lot. Some of Joy Cowley's psalms, I think, are so rooted in New Zealand experience. They're just so strongly grounded that congregations can really connect with them. I'm very interested in just about every phrase that you've used in those sentences over the last few minutes, because each one takes me into a different area of thought. And we could, if we could return to our New Zealand context in a few minutes, but I'd like to just stick with the fact that you were interested in um, the worlds created by uh, Tolkien and particularly Lewis, um, I haven't read the discarded image, but uh, it sounds very similar to a myth that he rewrote called Till We Have Faces. Oh, yes. yes, yes. Uh, yeah. And w w what I think is extremely provocative for Christians is the idea that actually we have to, uh, Christ invites us, to start to build the kingdom within us and by that he means to build our personalities you know until we actually have a, a face that is made concrete um that is not uh, is that similar to the discarded image you know we, we've got a whole lot of images from the past that we discard but actually the face that we make concrete is this accumulation of all the past that's coming to the forefront of our own thinking. And that's why the myth lives. Uh, I, I recall either Tolkien or Lewis said, um, a myth is a lie breathed through silver. So, yeah. mm -hmm. 
in other words, it becomes something that's far more than uh, just um, yeah a passing fancy. So all well, all the stories have to be peopled, and you know, I think that the critic, maybe it was Humphrey Carpenter, I'm not sure it was, but the critic who recognised that Tolkien started with language, but could not just stay with creating languages. You have to have the people who speak the language, and you have to have the social change that is around the language. Uh, somebody was interviewing Tolkien, you know, eventually uh, this was disclosed, that the, the languages the languages were his initial passion, but you can't have the language devoid of people. And uh, and I th and this it's an analogy for me around the Christian story. The we are invited into a story, but we have to people it with the reality that we can really feel close to. Because otherwise, and it's just that, a theory. Mm. Right, and is that what you're doing when you? Uh, contextualize into New Zealand. There's there's a voice that is not just the voice of the past, the voice of the 14th century preacher, but there's the voice of the the 21st century poet, yep. Colhoun or, or, or whoever, or the artist, uh, yep. whatever. Is that what you're doing when you yeah, preach? Yeah, and I think I. Cahoon is a particularly good example because he, of course, is always contemplating the difficulty that the doctor has as an expert. And if there's one thing that has probably harmed the appeal of the church in modern times, it's that sense of expertise, that people are coming to be where other people are smarter or other people have the answers or the preacher is going to tell them what to think. So a poet like Cahoon just helps us break through that, but using another area of life, using the area of life of doctoring um, and, and of pastoral care, actually, because he's a youth worker. And that is a really helpful way to get people to contemplate about what we uh, contemplate what we do Sunday by Sunday without banging on about what we do Sunday by Sunday, you know, uh, getting people to think in a bigger <laughs> lens, which, after all, is the purpose of is the purpose of faith, isn't it? Is to get us to think outside ourselves and to have a really good chance of finding connection with others. In your work uh, as a government, uh, sorry, a local government um, organizer, I suppose, of libraries, you, you, in some ways, you are curating a whole lot of experiences that aren't just books, that aren't just um, records, that aren't just audiovisual materials. You're somehow cur curating through the library a cultural heritage yes. that invites people to do exactly what the church wants people to do, to explore for themselves within that setting who they are. Is that a fair analogy of, yeah. of yes. your work? I think of that analogy quite a lot. And I think I, uh, I think of relevance and I think of importance in people's lives. So at work, in my work context, we have a phrase around Auckland's unique stories, the unique stories, the many unique stories of Tamaki Nakoto. And heritage these days, thankfully, is very much in the dimension of living heritage. So stories as identity that communities need to be able to access and always be adding to, especially in a diverse community like Auckland, you know, just really opening up the way that stories are collected and shared. That is what the church should be for, in my view. And it's certainly what the work of a librarian is about. Cultural artifacts take all sorts of formats and have uh, varying degrees of uh, formality about them in the formats. And so, yeah, I see quite a strong connection between the, the, the two kinds of uh, work. Mm. Um, one of the notable features, again, if I could just return to your preaching, is the ability to involve children. Uh, I've seen you pull out the tricks and goodness knows what. Uh, it's sort of like um, Dr. Morgan's Facebook <laughs> or something. <laughs> There's always something new in there. But I, again, I, I would suggest that you've learned a lot of this 
technique because of what goes on in the library system, which is so encouraging of young people to try and get into the library to participate in the, all the things that we're talking about. And a great example from another preacher just down the road from Pitt Street um, is John McDonald with his gathering of street people and all, all kinds of fringe people. Uh, and he gave, he gave the example at the recent School of Theology for the Auckland Synod the, that he got about 400 people involved in creating and publishing a zine. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know how he got them printed or, or whatever. And I sort of stuck my hand up and I said, did Greg Morgan, no, I didn't actually say did Greg Morgan, I said, did the Auckland Public Library look out and somehow grab the zine idea to, because you've got hundreds, if not thousands of children participating in library programs every school holidays. And I think zines are part of it. Is. Yeah, well, actually, uh, I was one of the people who brought uh, a zine collection into the library. Um, and that's a very long and interesting story in itself, so it's a particular point of pride. But um, all across libraries every day, you know, people are coming into non-judgmental indoor public space. They're also meeting libraries in other places as well, because librarians are active right throughout the community. Uh, at the moment, there's a book club which is happening in wine bars, for example. That's proving very popular with a, you know, a set of people who, are, who don't make it. Um, to the library during business hours. But it, um, libraries are there for the whole community, uh, non-judgmental, open, where people can just come and be indoors. You don't have to come for a particular program, although there's a lot in a library that you can take part in, and that's a particular delight. I think that children in our churches uh, traditionally get a bit of a rough deal when it comes to the traditional children's talk and the thing that I have tried very hard to uh, get out of my being is that urge when things are, um, are a bit tense to ask children lots of questions, you know, bombard them and then give them the impression that they have to give the right answer because if they give the right answer, the congregation feels relaxed, everybody nods, everybody's happy. What I try to do is to build an activity that the kids and the congregation, the adults, can take part in together. Uh, some as spectators, some as participants. You know, there's that poem of, of Wordsworth's about the father and the little boy. And the father is asking the little boy why he doesn't want to leave a particular house. And the little boy looks up and he says, it's the, um, it's the, um, what are those things? It's the wind, the thing that shows the direction of the wind, the wind. Um, oh, uh, the weather vane. The weather vane. Yeah, I forgot my language. It's the weather vane. And the little boy just picks that as an answer because he knows it will satisfy the adult. And I think that often in churches it can be a bit like that. The kids just must feel interrogated. So today what I did was I brought in a rocket and I put the rocket on the communion table. I happened to be sitting alongside a picture of John Wesley. The rocket was because New Zealand is now in the, in the space race. And also, of course, Ascension Sunday. So why would you not have a rocket? So I didn't labour that, but I just popped it there and I thought, well, people could think about that. And so uh, the congregation burst out laughing. And then for the activity with the children, I had um, a couple of tubes of cardboard and we had a relay race around the church. So they passed the baton. And that was a really good help to understand uh, John 17, 1 to 11, the passing of the baton. And I got the congregation to watch the kids at a point the baton was passed. And the congregation was not allowed to watch the last child uh, complete the race. They had to watch only the baton bit. Because they didn't turn their gaze to look at the person who was fulfilling the race, they didn't see what happened. Um, I didn't go as far as to have the choir, the, the finishing line was at the choir, I didn't go as far as to have the choir as the kind of band of heavenly angels, although it was very tempting, I have to tell you. Uh, so I think that kind of participation is so much stronger than just asking kids lots of questions. And that's what you see in libraries. The whole makerspace thing isn't about technology, it's not really about robots, it's not about any of the kind of gleaming tech. It's about people in a 
consumer society, and I say that as quite a consumer myself, but it is people having the chance to make something, to find something out, to ask you, because you're alongside me, how do I connect this thing together? That's what libraries excel at, and you know, I think churches need to do a bit more of that too. I think that's a fantastic message to um, uh, for for all our preachers, and uh, you know whether they're lay or ordained or um, part time pastors or full time or, or whatever, it doesn't really matter what the category is. It's really about how do we go about being genuinely involved with the people that have come to gather that Sunday, and yes. how do we enable them to participate in the act of worship. Um, I'd like to ask you a, a slightly different, take a slightly different tack with this question. Over a lifetime of academic study and then more recently in this uh, world of preaching, do you think that your faith has changed very much? And what's driven the changes in that time? Uh, yes. Well, as I said at the beginning, David, I wasn't brought up in the church. I wasn't even brought up in a Christian household. So my mother had been Salvation Army when she was young, but had left that church. And my father's family were Cooneyites. And by the time he went into the army, he was so tired of preachers um, plonking themselves at the family home and staying forever that he wrote he was an atheist <laughs> in his sign-up papers, which I don't think Dad was. And um, so I wasn't uh, brought up in a church family. When I was about six years of age, my father asked me one day what I was doing. I was sitting at the kitchen table and I had one of those Olympic pads, you know, with the really wide lines. And I was writing some stuff. And I said, I can remember saying to dad, I'm writing a hymn. And he said, oh, and he looked very taken aback. I think you should ask your mother whether you're allowed to. <laughs> And partly, so, you know, as I tell the story, I think, goodness me, you know, I sound like Blake seeing Ezekiel or something. But also just what a strange thing. You know, how on earth did I even think to do this? And it must have been in relation to something I had been reading, I guess. And um, as I as I just as I grew up, I just always felt that I was connected with spirituality, even though I didn't go to church. And then when I did start going, I had all of the um, passion and enthusiasm of the person who has found home. So, you know, I went into Pitt Street. I was actually going to a Presbyterian church. Some timing was wrong. I ended up in the Methodist church. I sat at the back. I sat in the corner and then I kind of moved down the church and uh, then became so included in the church that it almost drove me out. So I became chair of parish council and I was on every committee going. I was parish steward uh, and the, you know, there are stresses and strains in a community. And I realized at a certain time that if I kept up with all of that stuff, I wasn't actually able to worship and I needed to worship. So I pulled back from that. Uh, now I am in a place where I'm very grateful to the open nature of our church. I think it is. For all the debates we have internally, I think on the whole, you know, we're a pretty welcoming church and a pretty tolerant one. I also preach in a really tolerant Presbyterian congregation that I love very much. Uh, and I appreciate all of that. And it gives me the freedom in my own life to look at a whole lot of other things that I, that I don't really bring into my preaching. So I'm quite interested in, um, in the older new thought churches and Unitarianism. Um, I'm interested in those people who have clung to a spirituality, even though the frameworks of faith don't seem to suit them. And so I do quite a lot of thinking in those areas. And, um, uh, and uh, recently, um, Susan and Nan and Paul and I had the opportunity to hear Mavis Staples twice. And Maver Staples for me is just the experience of church. And I always remember in Auckland hearing Bernice Johnson Regan, who was the lead singer of Sweet Honey and the Rock, talking about the black church in America. And, uh, and she uh, asked, you know, she asked us as a, an audience to think, why would people stay in an institution which had to some degree supported slavery? And it was because when people went to church, they knew they were sane. 
So I continue to be fascinated by these notions of the usefulness of church and, um, and, and you know, just to ex explore some of those experiences. And uh, so, yeah, my, my faith is, is um, taking these turns all the time. But when I'm with a congregation, I think in advance of that congregation and why it's asked me to be there and what it needs. So I never feel that I compromise my own interest in other things, but I'm also there to serve the congregation. And you can do both, in my view. Yeah. Well, we've pretty well come to the end of our time for this evening, uh, but we've had a number of viewer responses to uh, Dr. Greg Morgan. And one of the questions that's been asked is, uh, really along the lines of back in the 14th century, how did we see this emergence of tension, if you like, between the orthodox and the unorthodox? How did they deal with religious waste, as it were, these 14th century preachers? Yeah, well, I was thinking about this um, uh, in, in preparation for this evening in terms of the sermons I looked at, because you can see quite a strong focus on the obligations of priests and people in the church hierarchy. So this is an era, you know, coming out of the 13th century into the 14th, very concerned with heresy and uh, orthodoxy, doing the right thing. And here are these sermons written for ordinary people, for a, for a lay audience, which had a very strong focus on the shepherd doing the right thing by God's people. And so, uh, you know, that undermining of the orthodoxy, very, very interesting. And if you think of some other um, uh, works like Langland and so on, I mean, you, you just those interesting social pressures bubbling underneath. And when writers were deciding what to focus on, what they uh, chose to give the energy to. And certainly in the sermons I looked at, it was around the obligations of the powerful. Well, I think that that's a marvellous lesson from six centuries ago to be applied to church life today. And uh, Greg, on behalf of the active audience in the studio, as it were, we all want to say thank you very much for a most stimulating session. And we look forward to uh, hearing your message in a variety of contexts. So once again, thank you. And thanks everybody. Thank you very much.